The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hey guys, buddy, what's going on, man? Yo, buddy. Congrats on the uh, on the packaging. Looks really cool. Uh, yeah, so excited. It's the simple things, man. It's the simple things. <laughs> so, um. If you've got like little bits of chicken feather on the outside of the egg, that probably means the bloom is intact, right? Yes. Okay. We do. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's actually like here in Mexico, you just go to like quite a number of stores, maybe not like a regular supermarket, but um, some of the small corner stores, um, like a lot of them still have that on. Yeah. Yeah. Mexico, I would think it's a, it's a typical thing. Um it makes it makes sense right like and then you don't have to refrigerate them you could keep them out but yeah you know. yeah a lot of times you'll go into the store and you'll see them um, you'll see eggs on the shelf not refrigerated yeah right. i remember that that confused me at first when i went into like a it's like a supermarket uh and the eggs are just kind of out i'm just like huh supposed to refrigerate this well, like the us does this i think the us is like are there any other countries that actually does that or is it just the us um, I don't Washington know. That's a good question. Yeah, you know, it's it's gov it's just a perfect example of government get getting involved and fucking things up, right? It's yep. like just just ruining a good thing. I mean, without without saying too much, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how um how legal it is to be <laughs> to be <laughs> to be sending eggs around without the bloom washed off but I, i'm going to i'm going to assume it is legal because right i mean how, how could it possibly not be right that evil bloom <laughs> how dare you uh, i mean the what's so crazy about it is that it's allegedly these laws are about protection um but really they should only be about disclosure right if you sell something that you didn't disclose properly that that's what you were doing um yeah i mean then maybe you could be liable for like some kind of damages or whatever right like okay on the outside of these eggs there could be extra bacteria and and stuff that might you know that you might need to be worried about um you know maybe you don't want to eat the entire outside of the shell i don't know uh, which is something some people do actually um right so it's like it, it's really it's the same thing like we talk about the sec and crypto regulation or a, any kind of thing in my mind it's just about disclosure people should just know what they're getting um, whereas like, it's odd because then the government will often just fight disclosure, like in the, in the terms of, um, GMO products. A lot of times, um, I want to say that the FDA is, has ruled certain products to be substantially equivalent with no differentiation or risk, um, from the non GMO product. And so like, in some cases, I don't think GMO products are required to label them as being GMO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Eggs. I mean, they, they they do they've done you know studies, right? So people that have access to, to good eggs, literally, uh, you know, societies that ha that overall have access to, to to quality eggs have a few IQ points higher than societies that don't have access to eggs. It's such a hmm. such such a vital important food, um, and yeah, even that government kind of gets in the way of of you and direct access to it from from the farmer. It's 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 sad to see, right? Uh, just 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 another example. It's pretty sad that we kind of kind of have to like try to figure out on our own how to go get get around it. Yeah, Here we are. We'll do it. That's one so, reason I I really awesome. like. Uh, in some ways, I like Mexico. In some ways, I don't. In a lot of ways, here in Mexico, um, a lot of these laws and a lot of this kind of bullshit is still two or three decades behind. Um, simply out of convenience, right? There's, I mean, it's kind of sad at the same time. But, um, you know, a lot of people don't have cars. A lot of people, I mean, they're just poorer here in general, which is, um, in, you know, in a way kind of sad. But in a way, like, the, ne the necessity of life and convenience um, keep, keeps things like cash, right? There's a lot of people in Mexico that are just totally unbanked. So cash is like an integral part of the society here. Um, and it's pretty much what I use anywhere I go. Um, and it's, you know, just practically speaking, to, to remove cash from society here in Mexico would be a massive leap. It would be really difficult to do that. And you'd get a lot of resistance. I mean, you, you'd probably, the people would probably start protesting and rioting pretty quickly. Um, they love to march here. At least you get a lot of marches and a lot of protests. 
Monero UK just sell the eggs for dog consumption. Exactly. That's yeah. I guess it should have been I more, like that yeah, yeah, yeah. Work around. Should have been more clear about that. That's ex precisely what uh, what we're doing here. So um, obviously, buy your own risk. These these are for for your pets, not to be consumed by humans. Although they're they're probably the, the best and healthiest eggs you possibly could have if you were to accidentally consume them. Uh, but yeah, no, these are eggs being sold for Monero for for your pets. There you go. Very cool. You know, one thing I wanted to mention, um, you said you got kind of a headache from working out. Um, yeah. If you if you have like a few intense workouts in a row, um, one thing that can happen is like, and I'm not saying this is the case. Uh, it's happened to me a couple of times where like I have kind of an extra layer of fat because I've been living an unhealthy lifestyle, you know, for let's just say the past month or something. Um, and then when I shed that layer of fat, especially if I do it really quickly, um, you know, to like jump back into the gym, good, good diet, restricted calories. Um, if your body has stored any excess toxins inside that fat, that shit can come out and you into your bloodstream and your body could like get rid of that, um, kind of at one moment. So you'll kind of feel sick for, for almost, you know, maybe a day you'll have like a headache, like some flu like symptoms, but it'll usually pass within like 24 hours. Me, yeah, that could be, well, I think, it, but it was an exertion thing, you know. I felt it was. I was lifting. Heavy, I felt it while I was lifting the heavy weight, so it kind of uh -huh. scared me a little bit. Like I was doing like leg press with like a ton of weight on it. Yeah, I was you gonna know? ask you what kind of um, exercises do you do? Yeah, I was. Do, I was doing legs. I was doing like uh, leg extension uh, for my for my hamstrings, like super high weight, and then I jumped straight from that to like a leg press with a lot of weight. I mean, a the lot. Legs. Of I think that explains it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, those are always the ones that get me like i've only been sick maybe two or three times from lifting and deadlifts were always involved yeah i just can't do those super heavy anymore because of my ankle injury oh, um, shit. but yeah deadlifts are the best if you could do them that's fantastic how's your ankle healing up it's good i mean it's just ne will never be the same i can never go super heavy because i have that that cartilage issue you know so they, they hmm. try they try doing what they can but it will never be the same. So if I go super heavy, I'm just going to re re injure it essentially. I can't remember, but did I ask you about, did you get stem cells? Like, was that part of the, the operation? No, they didn't. They took, they took some uh, um, bone marrow out of my hip and they, like, uh, yeah. used, they used that. Um, yeah. That's so I've heard, I've heard that they've done that for quite a long time because bone marrow is, is high in stem cells. Mm -hmm. Um, Man, you're really, you might get a lot of, um, if you have any cartilage left at all, um, you might get a little bit of um, help from stem cells just injecting that joint. Yeah, maybe I'll try it out. I mean, what, unfortunately, the doctor said what he screwed up, well, not what he screwed up on, but he said it like the situation was a little worse than he expected. So he wasn't able to get the, the, the stem cell paste or whatever we're calling it, the whatever he put in the divot of that was missing there of cartilage. He wasn't able to get it to stay. He said it was like kind of like slipping out. Hmm. Uh, that was that was ultimately the issue. So, but whatever. I'll eat my eggs. I'll be good to go. <laughs> okay. Well, um, can you guys see my charts here? Yeah, big big okay. weekend press, right? Yeah, um, we have more divergent action between stocks and crypto. Gold pumped, stocks dropped all week long. Stocks dropped and uh, and crypto pumped, which is um, you know kind of odd. So we'll uh, I guess we'll take a look at all that. And then we've also got um, the yield curves are starting to the inversion has like almost gotten back to zero. They're like massively correcting. Um, in fact, this was the biggest thing that kind of stuck out to me as I was reviewing the charts um, just this morning uh, is that. You know, we, we've been talking about this yield curve inversion coming back to normal. You've got all of the long term yields now that are starting to spike up pretty heavily while the short term yields are all still flat. Um, and you'd be surprised to know that this is um, this is very similar to what happened in 2008, um, where so here's 2008. Um, you'll notice that uh, we've kind of got this big dip happening. Uh, hang on, let me switch to. Uh, there we go. Got the brush. All right. So we had this big dip happening here, kind of flattened out, and then it uh, started coming to the upside. And so it was a similar thing where you had flat short-term yields for the most part. Um, in fact, and this time the short-term yields kind of dipped down while the long-term yields all dipped up. Now that still wasn't the major crash. The major crash didn't happen until somewhere um, right around here is when it really started dropping. You know what? Maybe just to 
just to be more specific, let's just overlay the S&P 500. All right, the candles are the S&P 500. Um, I realize that's a little bit, oh crap. Sorry about that. Got to put this, I got to pin this to a new, um, to a new scale. Usually there's an option that allows you to pin it to a new left scale. Okay, here we go. All right, the candles are the S&P uh, 500. And so you'll notice that um, it, it actually made, like technically made a higher high, even as rates started dropping and even as um, the yield curve continued to correct back to uh, something more normal. Um, so again, this is, this is starting to develop a similar pattern that we're seeing here today, um, as we saw back in, uh, back in 2007. So it could still be until next year before like any major recession hits. You'll notice that like technically the green here is recession, the big green box. That's when the recession technically started per, uh, whatever the government says, um, which is, I guess that's close enough, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, we had we had this big correction where long-term yields finally corrected back above the short-term yields, um, and then everything started coming down um, pretty, you know, just like substantially coming down as stocks topped out. And let's see how much of a difference was that? That would be fifteen hundred down to about um, thirteen hundred. So that only looks like fifteen percent drop, you know, at first. So it's not it's not a perfect comparison. Let's let's go back to um to current the current moment. So it's not a perfect comparison. Um, you've got a few things that are different, right? The uh, the federal funds rate is still slightly below um, the lines up here, uh, the, the short-term yields. Um, but we do have this correction that's happening. Um, it hasn't actually, the, the long-term yields haven't actually gotten above the short-term yields yet. Um, but we do have like, this, this pattern continues to develop. So that's something, again, keep an eye on. It's a long-term pattern. Um, you know, just, just keep your eye on that maybe once a week. Uh, even once a month is a good thing to to check out. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at crypto a little bit because that's kind of exciting. Um, volumes are on the bottom here. So this is the ETH BTC chart with combined volumes. And effectively, um, I mean, we haven't, you know, the, the combined mar market caps haven't really gotten back to their all-time highs, uh, the, or sorry, local highs, but um, Bitcoin um, actually has been looking pretty good. And you can see that on the bottom here, this is the GBTC premium, the the discount um, so it's still negative. It's still at negative 12, but man, this thing keeps steadily closing, steadily closing. I think it's because people do expect that the um, the ETF is going to be approved. Um, the SEC lost their case against Grayscale lawsuit. Um, we talked about this, I think, maybe a month ago. Um, that yeah, the 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 court ruled, and then I think the SEC they lost their appeal, um, saying that hey, you you were acting uh, capriciously. You were acting. Um, you were not like giving the proper consideration to the grayscale application for a full spot ETF. And so that news is one of the big things that has caused this, um, this gap to continue dropping. And this gap is something that we need to see continue to close um, to even hope for a bull market. As long as this thing remains negative, there's just no chance like that the, that the market is going to have like the kind of strength or even the psychology, like the, the sociology of it um, to, to convince people that, Hey, it's time to get in the market. So um, that's a good sign for price. Uh, we'll put that away for now. Um, so Bitcoin right now, uh, let's see, that's the eight hour route. Okay, so even overnight, we've had, we've had some big movements. Let's go to the daily. So Bitcoin is currently breaking above this like very, this very large triangle here. Um, so this line right here was kind of one of the last lines, I, I would say that you, the most shallow way you could draw the line just by cutting through that, um, uh, cutting through the October, November pump from 2021. And then you've kind of got like this big triangle uh, pattern that's forming here. And right now, Bitcoin looks like it's trying to break out of that. Um, if we look at the dominance, I'm sure that the dominance has got to be continuing to go up. Yeah, even in the last uh, day, uh, dominance continues to go up. One thing I would look at here and ask myself, is there the potential for a top? Um, we've got the, uh, all right, so there's kind of like the trend line at the moment. A uh, two-point trend line is, isn't that significant, but uh, you know, it's you could still draw it just to just to check it out. Um, but the thing in my mind that I'm looking at here are these these moving averages. You'll notice that this moving average cluster um, is uh, is kind of like that should be a significant resistance point. Although what you'll notice is that um, dominance got up to this area and then pulled back, and now it's um, it's encountering this very long-term. Um, moving average cluster again. So the way in which it's moving there gives it a higher chance to actually break through that. Um, so 
That's that's really like that's totally possible. And I do think that a lot of the hype, um, <laughs> you got to give it to to Bitcoiners um, and maximalists. There's a big group of them, or they're the biggest group in crypto uh, of any coin. Um, and they really do a good job of shilling things that um, that are hype optimistic that might not be entirely grounded in reality. Um, so right now I'm talking about BitVM. Um, I'm talking about CTV. And um, CTV is actually very powerful. Um, the, the things I've looked at that it could potentially do seem very powerful. They're intuitively powerful. Um, the short way to describe it is that basically, if you want to send me funds, what I can do is construct a UTXO that has a whole bunch of future transactions built into it. So what I would do is I'd construct a whole bunch of future transactions to people that I want. I would hash the entire like mass of those transactions um, and I would drop that hash into my UTXO receive address. So when someone sends me funds, now I've, un I've basically encumbered how those funds can be spent. Now that sounds kind of like, okay, cool, far out, bro. Uh, really tech nerdy kind of stuff. But the kinds of things that it enables you to do um, are very powerful um, from like security, from the ability to have one UTXO that like has a future transaction that's a cold storage UTXO that's like that that's that's never funds that have never been on chain, um, and then you can also still at the same time split that UTXO out in future transactions by revealing them, and you can create like networks of transactions and like it's it's interesting. It's like as with all layer two, there is complexity that is involved that's going to need to be solved um, if it's going to be useful, um, and then. Um, Let's see. Oh, and then BitVM. So BitVM is like their big thing. Like, oh, we can do anything. I can do anything. You can do better um, <laughs> to uh, to Ethereum and any other contracts platform, which is ironic because, you know, just two months ago, they were telling us how horrible and awful contracts are and why everything should just be scripts instead. Uh, but now they can do everything that everyone else can. So all, apparently all those things are really awesome now. Um, so the thing is, they're like, they're still constructing like little tiny things that work and they're trying to put the blocks together so that they can build more contracts. It's still an optimistic system like Lightning Network. You still have to come back to main chain and uh, and drop the proof of the thing that you did onto main chain. And you have to hope that the person is telling the truth. Otherwise, you've got to challenge them. And if not, um, there could be um, there could be these kinds of attacks like you see with Lightning Network, with like flood and loot. Um, it, but there's flood and loot's just like one type of Lightning Network attack um, where there's not enough main chain capacity to actually like settle the dispute on chain. And so you can get these different kinds of attacks that really have made um, Light Lightning Network difficult and cumbersome um, in ways for for developers. Um, in fact, just a couple of days ago, uh, um, one of the like a long term Lightning Network developer was said, "Hey, we imp we implemented some mitigations for this. Um, I don't know if it was a pinning attack. I can't remember which one it was. He he listed a whole bunch of them in this kind of write up, and he said, "Listen, we've 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 made mitigations for these, but advanced attackers could still take people's funds." And so he said, hey, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to work on Lightning Network anymore. Um, I feel like these problems are fundamental and I'm not sure we can ever resolve them. But if I'm wrong, maybe someone can correct me or show me exactly where I'm wrong. But for now, I'm going to quit working on Lightning Network de development. But anyways, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyways, so the point is that um, regardless of like the reality of the situation, how difficult the implementation is going to be, you've got this new thing in Bitcoin and people are really excited about it. And even though it's probably going to take like three to six years to actually build anything that might be useful. And even though you've got the danger that everything's going to crash, that doesn't matter. A lot of the hype and shilling is still going on. And I think that's a big part of, um, of helping to send Bitcoin um, dominance uh, significantly higher. But as we talked about before, I think the fact that FTX is not here to rescue shitcoins um, is a big deal. I think the fact that Binance is on the ropes um, is also a factor in that. So it's, you know, because I mean, obviously FTX and Binance, like their primary thing is, is, um, is shitcoins, shilling shitcoins. So anyways, um, yeah, Bitcoin before right you, now. Price. Before you move on, so yeah, what do you think about this LN thing, this get this uh, dev that came out and said he saw, uh, you know, critical critical issues with it? Is, is Does it look like that's legit? Is... I, I mean, I think so. I've That's like kind of been my primary complaint about Lightning Network for a very long time is that fundamentally with small blocks and constrained block space, you are susceptible to attacks the moment that anyone actually starts using Bitcoin. And um, we saw with the explosion of, um, of ordinals and how when the fees went up, and it doesn't matter that it was ordinals, it could have been for any reason. But when fees spiked up back in um, March or April, you saw like 20% or 15% of Lightning Network uh, Bitcoin just got like, it just left. Um, and you saw like these different kinds of attacks and suddenly people were saying, oh, wow, it's dangerous. And we're like, yeah, some of us have been saying this for a very long time. There are these, the fundamental problem is that 
When you have an optimistic system, you need block space to resolve any potential disputes if someone tries to take your funds. Um, Because effectively, like I can lie and close the channel in an old state where I have the funds, like I sent them to you, but then I try to close the channel in in a state before I sent them to you. You need to be able to get on chain to do that. I think that this lightning, um, uh, Riard, what's his name? I can't remember. um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Someone Riard. He's he's been he's been on Lightning Network for like four years. Let me look it up here because I posted about it. Uh, Rit uh, Antoine <laughs> Anto- Antone. He's the guy. Antone who, he's the guy who's leaving the project, right? Yeah, he's the guy saying, "Well, I'm you know I'm I'm, I'm my my involvement with the Lightning Network development is I'm gonna halt my my involvement there." Mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's legit. I think it's just a dude saying, "Hey." You know, many of these types of attacks that generally involve mempool congestion, although the most recent attack didn't involve mempool congestion, he said the the, the attack vector was like, hey, you can do this even without mempool, mempool congestion. Um, and they, they solved like the, the easy attack vector. But he said, listen, we still haven't we still can't solve like an advanced attacker could still drain funds from Lightning Network. Um, and there's like just all these these attacks that have been documented. They've tried to fix them, but they're they're mitigations. They're not real fixes. They're all like mitigations that make it harder. But um, they involve quite a lot of hoop jumping. I think it's legit. Um, I, I mean, I, a lot of us have been complaining uh, for years that that these kinds of attacks are going to be possible, and that if you ever had a significant amount of funds in Lightning Network, that this would happen. I've been saying for years, like, hey, just just prove it to me, right? Like. Get show me show me five hundred thousand Bitcoin in Lightning Network. Show me two hundred thousand Bitcoin in the Lightning Network, and have it not not be faint, uh, funds not be drained or attacked for let's just say a year or two. If we see that, and you can actually get onto Lightning Network and everything's still functioning, well then maybe I'll actually become a little bit of a believer. But I want to see the actual proof of it in the wild that it's actually working and not susceptible. Um, and so far, we just haven't seen that because no one's adopting it. Probably in part because of these problems and because Lightning Network is just cumbersome in general. Um, you could ask, uh, you could ask Seth for more info on that. He actually plays with lightning network. I just, you know, I just read the people that play with lightning network and, and the, you know, some of these papers and attacks and whatnot. So my, my knowledge is more theoretical on that, but Seth would be able to give like really good, um, hardcore knowledge on his experience. Um, so but you, but you, don't see, you don't see it becoming uh FUD that actually affects Bitcoin price and outlook, right? No, no. At the, at, for the meantime, no, not at all. Um, one of the things that, so you've got CTV right now is, uh, they, they need a soft fork. They, they need a new op code, um, op check template verify. So the, the thing where you're like constructing a bunch of future transactions and taking that hash and embedding that hash into your, it's like embedding it into your UTXO or something like that. I, I'm sure that's probably not the exact mechanism, but you can think of it like that, like colloquially, that's fine. Um, that would, that's like a template of transactions. That hash is your template. And so check template verify, um, effectively is the soft fork that they need to do that. Um, I'm sorry, what was your question? <laughs> ask, ask that again. No, I was, I was just saying, you know, do you see this potentially actually affecting Bitcoin's outlook and price this FUD? Oh um, yeah. The lightning network. No. So with check template verify and with these like bit VM and stuff, you've got this like new renewed promise that channel factories, um, could could become a real thing, right? Instead of because that's another big complaint. How do you actually onboard the world? Even Taj Dreja and Joseph Poon are like have explained the math on this that you need like 50, 100, maybe 150 megabyte blocks to actually onboard the world to Lightning Network. Um, which um, Bitcoiners, you know, I feel like I was a part of that push for the last year to like try and force them to admit that you can't actually, you know, you can't actually onboard the world. And they kept saying channel factories. And I'm like, what what channel factories? What are you talking about? And uh, they could never give a, a real answer, but you could actually, there's the promise with CTV and BitVM that you could potentially construct massive channel factories that one transaction opens a lot of channels for say a thousand, uh, a million people at once. Um, and that each of these people could individually leave um, that massive channel opening without forcing everyone else to close. Um, that promise now exists. And there's probably quite a few different constructions. The ones I've read, I haven't, I say once, I think I've read two. Um, I haven't been convinced though. Those don't look to me like the game theory on them doesn't sound right to me. It doesn't smell right. It sounds like there's weaknesses and sort of like this hoop, again, hoop jumping and monkey dancing that you have to do to try and get the thing to actually work and be reliable. Um, which is why I wonder. So anyways, no, I don't think it's going to affect price. None of this technical stuff matters. It doesn't affect price because Bitcoiners don't care about technical stuff. They just care that someone wrote a paper. I shouldn't say Bitcoiners because a lot of them are, are Monero people too. So, um, was, let me go with maximalist. Sorry, sorry guys. I didn't mean to, um, to, uh, trash anyone that's, um, you know, 
that's pluralistic in their thinking. Um, but anyways, maximalists, and that's a big part of like the loudest group. They don't care about that stuff. They don't pay attention. They just see someone wrote a paper that said you can do Turing completeness and they don't understand it's an optimistic system. They don't understand the complexities involved with the implementation and that it's going to be years before you actually see like real products that are probably like practically useful. And then still, even then, those are going to be simple products, not complex ones. Um, so, but they're really good at the game of get out there and talk about it and get everyone excited and pump the price. Um, and then of course, you know, the guys kind of behind the scenes love to leverage those social moments to, to pump price when they can. So right now, I think there's a lot of that involved with price going on here with Bitcoin, um, with the price pump. There's, you know, there's the promise of the new things that, that could be coming. Um, and there's also just the anti-correlation that we see with the stock market. Like stocks have gone down. Uncertainty is creeping up. We see the gold price. Um, let's go to the gold price. You know, gold price has, has really like could this be any more scammy? They just like smash it down and then suddenly come back up, right? This this smash down here was um, it's got that's got to be artificially induced to to some form or another, uh, and then it just like massively came back up. So hopefully, if you were looking to get some gold, some Pax G or some uh, physical or whatever, you know, like I said down here, I was like, hey, 20, 20 to thirty percent that would be responsible to get. Um, you know, we might come down to this area, but with this with this um, with this reaction to the upside. And I, I wouldn't necessarily expect that gold's going to make it down here now. Like that's very strong action. Um, it is kind of at resistance, right? You've got the gold price sitting here um, at the upper standard deviation bands. Plus you've also got, let's go to the weekly. Um, plus you've got kind of like this long-term line um, that you can draw. And I guess we got to go to the monthly. Let me turn off the wave magic. It takes makes the charts take forever to load when we do that. Um, yeah, so then you've got kind of like this other uh, this other important line right here. And you'll notice I kind of have it drawn two different ways because you've got the top of the wicks um, for the very, very top line. But then you've also kind of got like the, um, I do it where it's like either it's the close price, in this case would be the monthly close price, or you at least get two wicks that are in the neighborhood of that area, right? So this is actually a connection point because you've got really three, you got one, two, three wicks here. So even though the close price was down here, it's kind of like, yeah, but you got three times in three months got up to that same area. So that that really kind of, in my mind, is a place to draw a line. And then obviously you've got the, the close price here as well. So that's where price is currently sitting um, at this big green dildo that we had for, for the past month uh, of really three weeks of October. Um, so I think that it's possible that Bitcoin and crypto is currently starting to act a little bit like gold. Um, I think that I think the realization is starting to set in to the market. People are starting to say, hey, the Fed is is like recently this week, the Fed talked about how they're probably not going to raise interest rates because of um, because the bond yield curve, the way that that this yield curve is is working out um, where all these long term yields are pumping up. Um, Jay Powell said that um, Jay Powell, the prime ghoul himself, said that uh, the way that yields are pumping is effectively acting as kind of like a. Um, a rate hike in and of itself, and so that there's no need for them to, to hike rates. So um, they, they've got a, week, uh, a meeting coming. It's not next week. I think it's in like 10 days. Yeah, so it won't be next week. It'll be the week after. Um, so they'll probably hold rate steady there. Maybe they'll get one more rate hike. But the point is that I think the market is starting to realize that um, the Fed is about done raising rates um, and that, uh, you know, we're kind of like topping off here and everyone, like the market has had a, like two decades to digest the way that these moves happen. The Fed hikes rates, comes to a flat top, the yield curve corrects back to normal, and then things go into a recession and the stock market falls. And I think that people are starting to become antsy that, that a recession could be around the corner. The stock market has been quite optimistic, um, for quite a long time, but, um, it certainly didn't do that, that good this week. Um, and, Oh, one thing I wanted to show you guys was the comparison to when the war in Ukraine started. So this vertical line right here, um, that was the date of the Russian invasion. That's when the Russians invaded Ukraine. And what you'll notice is that you got like, it basically the day that they invaded was a big green dildo to the upside. The market had gapped down um, on, on a Wednesday. And then the news of the Ukraine invasion sent the markets up, you know, fucking the war pig trade. Uh, and then there was kind of like this uh, reversal to the downside and then like another big pump. Now, it's dangerous to try and just like, you know, overlay the price action. Um, but we had a very similar thing that just happened uh, right now. Um, so you got like basically near the bottom. And then the Israel thing happened on uh, October 6th, I believe it was. Was it October 6th, the fr a Friday? Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was the 7th or maybe it was the 8th. I could be wrong about that. 
anyways, the timing is, you know, still somewhat slightly congruent. Um, I mean, it's like, again, with the fact that um, we know that these guys affected, like Israel stood down, they knew that the attack was coming. They wanted it to come. It's like the dancing Israelis of 9-11. They were very aware of it. It's like when Netanyahu said that 9-11 was good for Israel, um, like they knew it was coming, at least at, at certain levels. Um, so anyways, <clears throat> stock markets pumped on the Israel war uh, the and the, the Palestine war, or I should say probably um, uh, Gaza war. Uh, I don't, the West Bank doesn't seem to be involved. I don't hear that in the news anywhere. Anyways, but things kind of came back down to, to their starting point. Um, maybe this, like these, these lines, these dotted lines you see, um, these should be like pretty strong resist, uh, support, uh, support lines in general. Um, and you'll notice like even price, like right here where the war broke out and right here, um, are pretty, like pretty similar levels. Um, so, uh, that's just kind of like a, um, an interesting thing to keep in the back of your mind here, if you're if you're a stock trader, um, you still kind of got this support line, which technically has been broken down. But stocks, like you'll notice, like stocks can break down these lines all the time. This thing could could rebound to the upside next week. Um, the, I think the head and shoulders is still kind of in play. Um, it's at least for the S and P, right? Uh, shoulder shoulder breakdown, retesting the neckline, and then now it's come back down. Um, that that's not like, this is not good action in general for the S and P. I would still say your higher risk is to the downside more. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, I, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they'll figure out a way to, to pull a rabbit out of a hat or something. And you've got the same kind of action here. Oh, wait, that's the S and P, uh, NASDAQ. Um, so the NASDAQ is actually quite a bit more optimistic, but it's still like, it's still basically failed at where you would expect it to fail. Right. So this, this uptrend line here, this, this big channel. Um, that we've talked about now for a while, uh, you know, this channel right here and saying, hey, really, the market's got ahead of itself. And to get back into this channel is probably healthy, long term, sustainable price action with minimal inflation. So it does seem to me like that's important um, that that needs to happen. So um, right now, Bitcoin price is looking optimistic. But, you know, to me, this isn't quite confirmed. Like you'll notice I got quite a few lines drawn here on this downsloping resistance. Um, again, let's take a look at that just really quick. Right. You can see that tested it there testing it here again. The fact that it's testing it twice in a row like that, kind of like boom, down, uh, held support, and then boom, come up to the upside. You really want to see this thing break and then hold this, this area here. Um, if it does not, that's bad price action and signals um, a move to the downside. So because what you've got here is a descending, a descending triangle. Um, these kinds of descending triangles, like if price were to come back down into this range here and then do something like that, you could expect this thing to break to the downside if that happens. That would be like that would be a very clear sign. That would be a very clear chart pattern in my mind um, to probably even take a short. So you really like you really need to see the Bitcoin price break out here and then hold it for the next at least week. Like I want to see this thing close next week um, above this. Like if we're going to try and put the bull trade on the table. Now, if it does that, I'm probably going to have to go 50-50 and start getting exposure um, to the market. Uh, or a little bit more exposure to the market just to make sure that I, I don't miss out in case this thing decides to pump some more. Um, so, oh, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Yeah, Ethereum's been losing. It's broken down this um, this uh, descending wedge. You know, I had some of the lines drawn on here and I, I don't know where they went. Maybe I, did I um, put them somewhere else perhaps? No, I've got to figure out where those lines went. Um, I meant to <laughs> I meant to do that uh, yesterday and I just, Forgot to get around to it. Okay, uh, so that's about all we have, except for obviously Monero. Um, now, Monero, uh, Monero, Bitcoin, kind of as Bitcoin is pumped, Monero has broken down um, from like we kind of made it out of this pump thing. We still seem to be capped off, you know, by this like horizontal area of significance. You'll notice that we have the um, that we got this line drawn as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like this. It it does make the fact that Monero doesn't go along with Bitcoin does make me a bit more suspicious, but at the same time, I have to ask myself, okay, you see the GBTC premium closing. Who's buying that up? It's probably some institutional investors, and those guys probably aren't interested in Monero. So I would normally want to say, oh, well, Monero isn't going along with Bitcoin, so is, is this fakery? But when you consider the GBT, GBTC premium closing back to zero from being so negative, I've got to think that... Um, I've got to think that that there is a significant organic component to that, even though it doesn't seem to be represented in Monero. Um, one thing that we did see that's kind of like really disappointing is the Monero dominance. Like we really want to break this line and it's kind of like, you know, almost broke it, almost confirmed it. 
and then uh, you know kind of came back to the downside here. So um, you know maybe we can look at um, what we can do is take XMR, which is the market cap of Monero. Um, all right, let's take that. There's two XMRs, so I don't know why it always does this. I, you have to type it the long way. Uh, crypto cap. Crypto cap XMR divided by total two. All right. So what we're going to look at, we're going to exclude Bitcoin. We're going to take a look at how Monero is doing relative to total market cap. Um, and right now, like it's it's hard to, I need to draw some lines. Um, I need to uh, examine this chart a little bit more. Um, maybe we could turn on some wave magic. Perhaps it's it's not going to work. Maybe we might need to um, do like a multiplication thing here. Uh, times, let's just say a million. Yeah, here we go. Um, so yeah, Monero's, but overall in general, like for the past, let's just call it a few months, Monero has been holding its own relative to basically everything else, right? To so the rest of the crypto market um, market cap, uh, Monero has been doing just fine, right? So we're, we're still kind of like holding in the upper area here. So overall, like Monero has still like been a, a pretty good coin to hold. Um, we've got XMR, Ethereum um, is, uh, has been, you know, going up, like doing pretty good. So uh, the other thing that we've got here is Monero versus the dollar, obviously, but there's not much to talk about here. Um, volumes have have been falling for quite a long time. Um, you know, I don't like to see this. The the white here is the four week. Uh, we're on the weekly chart, so the white line here is the is it a four week? I think it's a four week moving average of volume. Uh, five week moving average. So, um, yeah, we've our volumes are like are pretty low. Um, this is Kraken, obviously. So the the primary place you would trade Monero for fiat on on an exchange is is Kraken. So, um, but yeah, price hasn't really done much. So there's not much to talk about with Monero US dollar. We have been going up with the rest of the crypto market. So that's nice. Um, really, again, this kind of area uh, is a place that you could expect resistance, kind of like it happened here. Um, and a lot of crypto charts look like this. You've got these, um, you've got the long-term standard deviation bands and you just see ranging. It's just up and down, up and down, up and down. At some point this will break out. Um, you know, our hope is obviously that it breaks out to the upside. Um, but uh, yeah, right now it's just kind of, it's light positive action. Things look opt optimistic for crypto. Things look pessimistic for stocks um, and things look optimistic for gold, even though gold is kind of at a bit of a resistance right here. So um, that would be, that would be kind of my, my summary overall here today. So that's all I got for you. All right, buddy. Thank you as always. So, so, oh. so not much, not much Monero action as usual. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Monero is kind of, you know, Stable coin, stable coin area. Someone asked me here, um, XMR Pirate, last time. So Congress bought into defense stocks for Israel, got attacked. I need to go check that source. It was, um, uh, I saw like the, like a PDF or a screenshot of, um, of the report, but um, there's like some kind of report that gets generated. I've seen the report before, um, like looked at the link and like, oh shit, okay, this is like an official report. I didn't look at this one. I just like, okay, I just assumed that, that, um, the screenshot was good enough. It could be fake news, bro. Um, I haven't checked into it personally, so uh, maybe I should do that. I'll try and I'll try and remember to do that this week. All right, definitely. Can you stick around today? Because I'd love to get your input on what we saw with the uh, what was it? it was the U.S. Treasury that came out, right? Yeah. Uh, um, was it the? It was um, no. It was FinCEN. FinCEN issued a recommendation so. for rules that they want to see made, and. Um, very broad language. They they seem to just be getting more general and broad with their language as time goes on. Yeah, would love to uh, get your input on that. What you think? I mean, you, you do you foresee any any potential impact on on price? Or are you starting to see? You know, are we seeing any inklings of that? I mean, obviously, obviously not, right? When we when we look at the price here, but um, if would, it gets implemented, I don't think that that would be a huge price impact. Um, to me, just it kind of just looks like more of the same. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. You it sounds like you had another question. Well, is it, is it because you feel like that that sentiment is already priced in? Like those who are are already scared of that potential reality are already out of the Monero market, whereas those that are in Monero using Monero don't really care, right? Where they're they're ready for whatever may happen. Yeah, exactly. Like. And even like in, across the broader crypto ecosystem, they've been issuing these legal kinds of attacks since um, like since the beginning of the year, uh, since March, since February. So I think that any new news like this is it's not like hugely impactful, especially because it's FinCEN just issuing a rules recommendation at the moment. 
um, it's not actually like requiring anyone to do anything. So, um, and I think by the time that might get implemented as a rules recommendation, um, it's funny how news will be one time in one scenario, it'll be con contribution to the downside and in another scenario, it'll be bullish. So hypothetically, if this gets implemented, say a year from now, and these legal problems start getting resolved and you start seeing ETFs and you start seeing institutional FOMO, uh, you know, narratives hit the, hit the news again, um, this news with FinCEN, once they actually make the rule and actually say, hey, y'all need to implement this within two years, what you'll see is people say, oh my gosh, regulation, finally, the Wild West days of crypto are over and the, the, the institutionals can get in and they can adopt organically and we can see our bags pumped to the moon, which is, you know, all the maximalist ever wants to see anyways. And I mean, maximalist across every coin. All right. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. And cool. I'll stick yeah. around, bro. Hope to hear from you later. Cool. All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks.